a husband of mine in here to pray us in. Honey, can you come in? And uh, then we'll get going. You guys know he doesn't, or uh, Connie, he doesn't like to be <laughs> on screen. You got one that's a ham that's done this for years, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I don't even want to be out there. <laughs> yeah, I'm but, not as glamorous. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's so funny, but here we are. He's a prayer <laughs> warrior, though. Yes, he is. Oh, yes, goodness. he is. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. I think I'm going to keep him. I think you should. If you don't, I'll take them. Yeah, there was a, like a 30 day guarantee, and then there was you can't return them anymore. So it kind of. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this beautiful day, Lord, and beautiful morning of worship and baptism and mm -hmm. praise. Lord, thank you so much for that. And Lord, the, the message tonight that you've put on Gracie's heart is so very important. And God, we just look so forward to um, going forward with the with the lessons and the training. And, and God, we just ask for your anointing upon every word that Grace is going to speak tonight and that you, Holy Spirit, would, would um, touch each of our hearts, Lord. And we just pray for every heart that's going to be listening to the recording, Lord, around the world, wherever that may be. So God, we just give you praise and glory for everything. And it's in Jesus' precious holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. 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 Thank you, honey. So he'll be tuning in uh, about, I don't know, 10, 12 feet away or whatever, as usual. But, uh, you know, we're we're embarking on a study here um, at the well. And so everything that we're going to uh, be looking at together on Sunday nights is going to be kind of riding along with that whole theme that the Lord uh, not only has uh, you know put on my heart, but that has is um, it's going to be a um, a, a Bible study that we're doing. And so we're looking very closely at spiritual warfare. Listen, guys, we've been living like wussies. Okay. That's the bottom line. Can you see my screen guys? Yes. Okay. Yes. We have been living, you know, like, uh, like wussies, like cowards, like we don't understand the power that we have been given. And so it's time for us to, to peel back the layers of those things and take a look and just be empowered by what uh, Christ has given to us. And, and when we, uh, you know, get the whole picture, we're going to live our lives differently. You know, we're going to, we're going to be able to live victoriously over all kinds of things, you know, because that's what God's given us. Why don't we do it now? To be honest with you, um, you know, most, a lot of churches teach against that kind of thing. You know, we, we kind of get, uh, raised up with a, you know, with a certain, um, you know, denomination, and then that's it. Uh, uh, several years ago, I did away with denominations. I, I started studying so much on my own, and I would see differences. And I said, well, you know, wait a minute, we have one God, we have one word, and we have one spirit. And there's no reason to be on different pages with that stuff. We can all be on the same page. And so that's what started it. The last week, we were looking at um, how we should be the devil's worst nightmare. Listen, he, he we, if we're doing and uh, living within the power of the, of the spirit, if we're li uh, doing what we're supposed to do, if we are standing in strength, if we're armored up, we are his worst nightmare. But if we don't do that, we're just, uh, he, we're just going to fall prey to his antics. We're going to start listening to thoughts that, you know, defeating thoughts and, and living a life, uh, you know, like pussies instead of the warriors that we're supposed to be. And so that's where we were last week. This week, we're looking at uh, family traits. And, you know, uh, family trait, or excuse me, traits means a, a distinguishing quality or characteristic typically belonging to a person. I was sharing this morning about I've got four beautiful children, five actually, one is already waiting for us in heaven, but uh, four beautiful children. And, uh, you know, when they were each born, I, I'd be like looking for myself in them, you know, <laughs> does it have my, my eyes, does it have my lips? You know, I, I was looking for myself in these children and, and, you know, I see expressions and things like that, a little bit of my eyes. Uh, it's hard to tell in a couple of them, but, uh, you know, the bottom line is that, you know, I don't see much of me in them at all, physically, physical characteristics. And then now that the gene pool has been divided up even more, and I have grandchildren, I don't know who these kids are, but they don't look anything like my people, as we would say, right? They don't look anything like us. So it's a, it's really kind of interesting. But, you know, I was, I was people were laughing. In fact, I can still see some faces as, as 
as I was sharing this this morning, when my first was born, Ashley uh, is my oldest. Uh, oh my goodness, I can't believe she's going to be 40 in October. But anyway, when she was born, that thing, I looked at that baby and said, that can't be my baby. It just can't be my baby. <laughs> you know, she was, uh, it, it was a long delivery process. So she had an elongated head and the ladies auxiliary had knitted these little, uh, you know, uh, bonnets or not bonnets what are caps for them and uh the, the hers was neon orange i kept pulling that thing off and hiding it they kept bringing another orange one back she had really super white skin and she was beat up by the four sips on i look at that thing and say there's no way if, it, if i hadn't had a natural uh, delivery and been right there when she was born i would have denied <laughs> she was mine but so the physical characteristics you know you just really can't rely on those things right we don't know uh, what the outcome will be there but uh, we can also, we can look at some traits. I look at each one of my children and maybe you could do the same thing. You know, my my oldest, I can see part of me, a little piece of me in each one of them. None of them are just like me. We wouldn't want life to be that way, right? But there's a piece of me. And I would tell them as they were growing up, you know, what you what we do is we look for the good in the, in the parenting. You, you look at the things that you loved about uh, your upbringing and things about me that you didn't care for where you just don't repeat it, right? That's the bottom line. But my Ashley is the playful one. You know, she's that. Uh, she just has such a good time with her kids. Just simple fun. She's the first one that 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 likes the flashy things, and she just likes fun. She's a simple woman. She's a oh boy, she's a devout believer, um, and she's raising her kids, uh, you know, in a beautiful Christian home. She has that playful kind of side of me. I like to sit in the grass with my grandchildren and just talk and look at the clouds. I like simple things, right? And then the next one is Jordan. And Jordan is local. Jordan is uh, joins us uh, a good part of the time in church, and she is a uh, she is that side of me that's feisty. Uh, you know, she's not a, <laughs> she can not afraid. She's not a redneck. She doesn't yell at you or anything, but she's not afraid to. You know, the words come to her very quickly. She's a, a, a good businesswoman. So she's got that side of me where she's, uh, you know, in a career and doing very well, uh, you know, and she, but she also has this side that can break her sometimes. And that side is she wants to fix everybody. If there's something going on in the family, she just wants to, she just drive herself crazy and drive herself into the ground, just like her mama does. Sometimes I own too much of it, you know, because of that mother thing. So that part of her, she has admitted. Then there's Clayton. He's the oldest boy. And Clayton, uh, the others always uh, accused me of, of, of him being my favorite because I treated Clayton differently. It wasn't a male child thing. It wasn't a, you know, first male child thing. It was that his character, his, I mean, his his temperament was different. He's a, I call him today. He's a, how old is he? He's 35. He's my, I call him my gentle giant. And he is. And he was always just more gentle. If I had dealt with him in the way I dealt with everybody, just a canned thing, if you will, it would have crushed him. He's not a wussy, but he's a gentle spirit. He doesn't need a strong arm. He just needs to be told, you know, you did wrong. And he'd be, you know, crying and saying, I'm sorry. And then there's Jared. And he's the one that lives close by. If you see me post pictures of, of grandchildren that live close by, that's him. Jared's got my, uh, it's almost like a, he likes he likes to be a practical joker. He's got a great belly laugh. And, and he loves it. It's a kick out of uh, practical jokes. He loves his family, you know, big time. Uh, you know, and he's got this entrepreneur way about him. And that, that's certainly, you know, uh, along with me. He always wanted to know how things work. You know, how does my business work? Why do you get paid to do blah, 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 blah. You know, he just always wanted to know. So I see traits in them, you know, that but that that came from me. The biggest thing that I uh, celebrate that came from me is a legacy of my faith. So I can say, praise the Lord. They all know Jesus. And boy, is that a gift for a parent to have. Right. So now we're into the to the next generation. But there are some things, you know, about me that I'm glad they didn't uh, pick up. I'm glad they didn't want to repeat. I'm glad they saw and said, wait a minute, I'll go fine tune that part <laughs> and, you know, and not go on to repeat some things. Because you see, we get things wrong when we go through this life. We, we tend to think that we inherited something. That, well, she's like her mother. Well, he's like his father. You know, we, we, we look at these bad things, if you will, bad traits or bad character or bad whatever, sin, you know, and, and we, we, but we don't inherit those bad things. We embrace them as our own. We say, well, that's just the way my family is. That's just the way this is. That's just the way that is. And we, we give it a label and we embrace it. But none of those things, you know, bad things, if you will, bad characteristics, none of those things are of God. So we give bad traits 
labels of, and we act like we're dealing with a disease, like it's incurable. Well, my daddy was an alcoholic, so you know, finish the sentence, right? We act as if it was inc incurable. Today, we're in a world where so many people say, well, we were born that way. You were not born with a, a, a sexual preference outside of what God designed. That's not true. You're not born to believe that way. You're not born uh, you know, half man, half woman, you're not born that way, you know, but we're putting labels on things. So we, and many uh, people in the world today, they live as if they have no choice whatsoever. But I can assure you with Jesus Christ, with the healing power, we all have a choice. We do not have to repeat these things. We are not destined to have bad things just because maybe some things were in our family. So, you know, you have no faith. Um, that life can be or is different with Jesus, you know, maybe that's what's true for you. But Proverbs 26, 11 says, as a dog returns to its vomit, so fools repeat their folly. I tell you, that's sick, isn't it? Every one of us seen a dog vomit and return to it. And really, that's what we do when we make excuses that we can't change something, fix something, heal something in our life. And we say the words of Jesus and we go right back to it, just like a dog going back to vomit. That's not faith at all, guys. That's bondage. That's a, a, a spiritual stronghold that needs to be dealt with, that can be dealt with. There can be freedom when we understand the battle. And that's what we're going to be talking about for several weeks moving forward. So there are traits to our Heavenly Father, right? I've told people we, in fact, I may have said to one of you at some point, you know, we're, we, you know, you're my uh, sister from another mother. We've got the same father, right? So it doesn't matter. Your earthly father, if, if if he unfortunately disappointed you or he wasn't good to you, or maybe you didn't have one, right? But the traits of our heavenly father are what we need to focus on. The Galatians 5.22 really spells it out. It says the fruit of the spirit, which, you know, of course, what I'm using the, the term very loosely traits is love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And, and against such, there is no law. And what that really means is that if you have the fruit of the spirit, um, he, he does, you don't need the law, right? You, you're already living in the law. It's already a done deal. He's already fulfilled it in your life. You know, so we see the sign of faith, if you will, uh, the sign of your uh, uh, Christians uh, when we see some of the fruit of the spirit. They're taking on the characteristic, uh, uh, taking on the traits of our heavenly father. We don't see these things. Things. There's a problem, Houston. It, you you may not know our father, right? And so that's what it looks like for those of us of faith. Disciples, uh, we're all disciples. And what does that mean? Again, we studied that a few weeks ago. That means to be followers of Jesus, uh, you know, to be students of Jesus. And that should be all of us, right? And so we should have uh, be taking on some of the characteristics. But, you know, the Bible goes on and on. And you, you will have uh, this recording. Uh, if you want to screenshot some of the scripture, it's just too much information for me to go through verse by verse by verse. But, you know, there's a, a detailed portrait, if you will, of the character of God. He, he's a beautiful God. He's not just some, you know, fierce God, but although he can be, right, he's beautiful. But one of the most outstanding features of God or his character, um, you know, is that he's a loving father to all believers. You know, it doesn't matter what somebody's done. It doesn't matter what kind of filth and vile things we've had in our lives. It doesn't matter uh, you know, it could be a serial killer. It doesn't matter. You know, he's a loving father and he's there to offer that unconditional love. Uh, and we can see it throughout scripture. God, by his nature, is completely good. There's no, there's nothing that's not good about him. In fact, there's nothing that's good that's not without him. So, you know, the word says there's no good thing apart from you, dear Lord. So, you know, everything good can comes from him. So he has this, our best interests at heart. He loves us. It's not just a um, you know, a, a happy expression, if you will, to say he's our father. He's our heavenly father and he loves us and wants what's good for us. His holiness is unequal. There's there's nobody like him. There's nobody holy. He's in fact, uh, you know, remember when uh, Moses was saying, you know, uh, what are they calling? He says, I am the I am. There aren't even words for, for him, right? He's the rock. You know, another defining character uh, is his righteousness, meaning he exists in a state of perfection. But what, listen, we're, we're trying to take on the character of Christ and we're trying to you know, uh, you develop those traits, if you will, 
We're never going to be that. We know that. That's we can't sit back in a cop out and say, well, we can't be, gee, I can't be perfect. Well, you know what? We won't. But his word says, be holy as I am holy. So the whole goal in this life as a Christian be, should be to strive to be like him in every way humanly possible on this side of heaven, right? So it's a struggle. It's a, we, we go through tests and we persevere like Paul. We finish the race. You know, Paul said, oh my goodness, Paul struggled. You remember where Paul came from? And he, and he said, the very things I want to do, I don't do. And things I don't want to do, I do. And I, so does that sound familiar to you? It should, because it's, it's, it's certainly familiar for most of us. So we're never really going to get there, right? But the, the, that's not a reason or excuse to not try. It's not a reason to say, and I, I, I'm sorry that I don't have a better um, description of what I teach about there, but it's it's like cheap grace. It's like, I got Jesus. He died. That's, a, that's the only thing that matters. I don't need to do anything. Now, you, your salvation is not conditional. Don't get me wrong. But your journey and how you finish this race, man, you do not just sit back. And so we 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 have been relaxed. You know what happens when you get that, you know, cushy feeling, I'm good because I have Jesus and you don't look beyond it. You don't know how to fight the war we're in. You just think Jesus is going to do it. But he tells us to do it. He tells us to fight it. He tells us to stick your or get your armor on and fight like the warriors you are. He's not going to do that for us. He'll protect us. He'll command the angels to come to us, but he expects us to live this life out and to be an ambassador for him. And, and it takes a little work to do that. He's also a just God. You know, he, there is no flaw in him, right? And, 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 and it's so uh, frustrating sometimes when people, you know, the Bible says to live out, live out your salvation with fear and trembling. Well, you know, the fear and trembling comes from understanding, you know, who God is and who you are. You know, that you don't, listen, I know what a wretch I was. I still am in awe of a God who would, uh, you know, choose me before the foundations of the earth, a wretch, knowing I was going to live a life like that before he called me to himself. But you know what? He's not a God to mess with, with his own people, his chosen people over and over. You'll read in the Old Testament where, you know, they started worshiping idols and he, boom, he took away the rain. He took away the food. He, he made them miserable. He let their enemies take them over. He, there was bloodshed because God was offended that his people were no longer worshiping him. So he's a just God. In loving, compassionate, gracious, kind, and merciful are all the basic central descriptions, if you will, of the character of God. And you read that in Nehemiah. It's a beautiful thing. So the, all the good things, there's no end. We could spend forever trying to describe the goodness of God. But part of, part of his character is faithfulness. You know, he's faithful, who has called you into fellowship with the son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, comes from 1 Corinthians. He's faithful. He's not going anywhere. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Who can you say about that in this life, right? So in, in our struggles and our failures and we fall down. He picks us back up. He says, I'll take you by the hand. I'll lead you. Uh, you acknowledge me and I'll, I'll set your path straight. Oh my goodness. What more do we need? Right. And so um, he, his character uh, can never be questioned. God is truthful. His word is true. Uh, we know that we have that the Bible that we should be in. You know, I'm, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about John Ramirez in a minute. Evangelist John Ramirez. And uh, he was a um, high priest in the satanic church and Jesus got him. Well, how cool is that? Right. But, you know, he's, he talks about how he said, I would sit before the devil and talk for hours. And, and, and most Christians talk a few minutes. You pray a few minutes a day. How convicting of that. Right. And so we know that his word is true. We have the, the gift. Guys, we can't lose sight of what the gift of, of having his word in our hands. You know, there are countries you read about them and that might happen to us one day that you can't even, it's not even possible for you to have a Bible in your hands. So, you know, his word and what a gift it is. And, you know, I've said so many times, I, I don't know how many books I've, I've read. I used to be a really avid reader. I don't read as much now for whatever reason, but nonetheless, the Bible is the only book that can read me. And so we need to be in it, right? Uh, we know that Patience and long suffering are also attributes of, of God. You know, he is slow to anger. Don't you wonder sometimes if I did? I certainly have. Wow, Lord, I just, you know, I, I can't believe you've been patient with me. I'm sorry it took me so long. I'm sorry I stayed in that sin for so long. Whatever it is, he's slow to anger. He's an amazing God. But the more you dig into the scripture, you know, the more you uncover the beautiful facets of God. 
always and forever. If you outlive Methuselah, you'd never have uh, enough time to really capture and to embrace all that he is, you know. Now, he's the all-knowing, all-powerful, all-present, everywhere God. And again, I would encourage you to go back, you know, to look at some of the scripture that I've cited throughout this whole, you know, teaching, because there's a whole lot of meat there that went into just uh, to be able to give this to you tonight. And, but you know what? We have a choice. So we look at him and again, we can cop out and say, well, it's not possible. You know, that that goal to be like Christ is, is way, way up there. So I'll just cop out that that's not the way we're so we're supposed to strive to mirror our father's character, no matter what. And if you don't want to mirror his character or if you don't think it's necessary to try to mirror his character, we need to talk outside of this call. So you either strive to mirror his character or we willingly rebel against him. There's no middle of the road with God. You know, he he is long suffering. He will always forgive us. He's patient. He sent his son to die for us. But the bottom line is, you know, we, we, it's he's a black and white God. You're either for him or you're against him. You either love him or you hate him. You either serve him or you're you're you 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 don't right. You you either heaven bound or you're bound for hell. There is nothing middle of the road. And so we either strive. It's our goal to. And, and we and we and we struggle when we know we've disappointed and we've gone against his word We're we're like David, boom, to my knees. You know, we want forgiveness. We want to make it right. We want to confess it, and re, you know, repent from it. Not because we're afraid we'll lose our salvation, but because we love him so much. So we're either there or we are willingly like a two year old a child rebelling against him. We are choosing to rebel against him. So, boy, that's a very convicting thing when you think about it. We have to, uh, you know, dissect it sometimes and get it down to the to the raw truth. Second Timothy 3, 1, one of my favorites, by the way, especially at such a time as this. But understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty for people who are lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, uh, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Now, you know, I'm going to pause right there because one of the things that this is something I, again, I speak of often, the people having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. When you look at this list, it would be human nature to say, wow, that's a horrible list. I'm not there. Let me tell you something. We're all there somewhere. Okay. Somewhere we're in there. And 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 somewhere we're in a couple of those places, right? Where you know, slanderous or without self control, whatever. We're all been known to be in there, and so it's not the, you know just the losers and the horrific people in the world. These are these are people we're rubbing elbows with every day. The churches are filled with all across America, right? People having the appearance of godliness, they look right, uh, you know, it sounds right. We, they, they come to church and check it off the list, but they deny the power of God. And again, as we embark on the study that we're, we're, we're getting ready to launch, it, it's all about that. It's all about looking at what am I leaving? Listen, I want everything God has for me. I don't want to leave anything on the table. And I realized through teaching, I've left a lot on the table and I want to capture it, right? I do not want to deny the power of God. Frankly, I don't think any of us have the uh, the, the ability to, to endure what we're going to be facing if we live long enough, right? So I want to know I've got his power, you know, and furthermore, it says avoid such people. These, these again, these, this isn't the world we're talking about necessarily. This is anybody that has the appearance of godliness, but deny its power. And so, you know, avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak, and uh, uh, the other translation, King, uh, uh, King James says, weak-willed women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions. So basically it said, oh, these deceivers, you got to watch these guys, man, they're sneaky. And they'll get in there and take advantage of you and your family. It's not just a female thing. In other words, it's, you know, uh, descriptive of the nature. Uh, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always Always learning and never able to arrive at the uh, uh, knowledge of truth. Isn't that true? That is, boy, the poor people that listen and, and every week or come to the well every week, they, they probably get sick of me saying this. But this is really the way church and so many churches are today. Their intellectual approach to their faith, right? I mean, I can think of some just amazing 
uh, Bible teachers. I, I would never uh, listen in to them and not learn. They're, they're gifted teachers, right? No doubt about it. But, but there's, and so many people, thousands of people, three services, four services, you can't get enough of that, man. You got the rock band and the teaching and it's good stuff. That's an intellectual. They're always learning. But, but never able to arrive at acknowledge of truth. And of course, I'm not talking about everybody, but I'm talking generally speaking. When you get stuck with just this uh, learn, 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 but there's never any application, you're not there with the truth. And you know what? The sad thing is, it's that knowledge of truth that so many churches have whitewashed the gospel and they don't even preach it anymore. They don't preach it. They, they're, they're, they're told that you don't talk about Things like sin and the wages of sin is death and money. You don't talk. Those three things are off limits because they're scary things. They're negative things. They're things that make people not want to come. Listen, not understanding those things could send them to hell. But most churches are staying away from the knowledge of truth and exchanging that for a meaty intellectual college level sermon so you can learn a little bit more and break down the Hebrew and the Greek, right? And I'm not saying we're not supposed to do that. We are. But the bottom line is that's the description of so many churches. And we see that, uh, you know, coming down the pike from, from Timothy. And so, again, those who have a form of godliness are those who make an outward display of religion. Looks good. Sounds good. You know, but, it, but it's got to do the whole picture, right? Looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, walks like a duck, it's a duck. It, it's got to have the whole thing going on. They represent themselves of godly. You know, they might have a bumper sticker cross around their neck and say they go to the First Baptist Church of Main Street, where the last center, six generations have gone. Doesn't mean a whole lot, right? But it's because so much of that is all for show. So they're all talk and no action. Uh, I, some of the most disappointing moments in my entire uh, you know, walk have been to be in the presence of, you know, Christians or Christian, you know, I'm saying that they've got the Christian trump card and have them behave horrifically in public, you know, like berate a waitress or a waiter in a restaurant like they're that like that they're nothing or or to slam some poor clerk in a store because she gave out the wrong change and they just berate her you know, acting like so, like the Pharisees, like they just deserve so much. These are people that are all talking no action. Listen, you got Jesus in you and you live for him, not just with him. It's impossible for you to be that way. You know, it's it won't be for show at all. It just naturally come out of your pores. You know, and I am honored when I hear people say, man, you say the name of Jesus all day long. I do. It's naturally coming out of my pores because I live for him. He's my all in all, right? And so, there are so many people, again, they, the, the form of godliness and deny power are those people who look good on the outside. You know, they got it going on to check the church off the list, but they deny the power of God in their own lives. We should never be here a, a piece of news. And I'm, I'm right there with everybody, by the way. We should never have our heart go in our throat and get scared over something we just heard or we're feeling like a weakling that we can't do anything about. Oh, never should we ever feel that way. Again, remember Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And so when we look at the, uh, you know, the, 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 the form of godliness people and denying his power, we need to remember what the, the, the character of our Lord looks like. If they don't have it, we need to talk to them. If you don't have it, I need to talk to you, you know, right? Because it's definitely going to take on the character the same way, frankly, as, uh, you know, in a different level, the way my children took on the traits of me that they liked, right? They, this In the same way, they, they wanted to become, because, of, you know, they grow up, they're young, they respect you, they love you, right? They wanted to be like me in certain ways. And in certain other ways, they were around me so much they had, they had no, no choice in the matter. And that's the way it is when you're with Jesus, when you're around him so much and you include him in your whole life and you can't get enough of him, you're going to take on those traits. It's not going to be uh, laborious for you. It's going to be glorious for you. So there's no be power behind the religion of people like that. And it's evidence in the fact that their their lives don't change. They get saved, they get dunked, they go on and nothing changes. They just like that dog returning to vomit. They just continue to do the same things. They it, the only difference is they got their name in the in the in the membership of the church, right? They speak of God and they live in sin. And and listen, it's not like you're never going to sin. Unfortunately, we are going to sin. 
right? But we're going to send less and less when we spend more and more of time with him and we give him more and more and more of our lives. We're going to do that less. But, you know, uh, these people aren't doing that. So they speak of God and they live in sin and they're fine with that arrangement. I was talking today about that. Remember that WWJD? What would Jesus do? Bracelet. Oh my goodness. <laughs> the people who came up with that, you know, and it's, it's great in theory. But I wonder if people ever looked at it and said, when they're living out their lives, you know, did they ever look at it and say, wait a minute, hold on, time out. And somebody just offended me. What would Jesus do? Do they really do that? Look at what would Jesus do? And so these people speaking of God and a uh, form of godliness, denying his power, probably don't. We're going now to the key scripture for the night, believe it or not. And that is in Mark 16. And 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 I highlighted actually just cut and paste the scripture up here because you probably see in your Bible when it gets more, between Mark 16, 8 and Mark 16, 9, it probably has a notation there. It says the earliest manuscripts and some other ancient witnesses do not have verses 9 through 20. Well, how interesting is that? See, the theologians, man, they've been talking about this and debating this for since the beginning of time almost. Some people say, oh, no, it's not written, you know, uh, uh, the way Mark wrote. It, it, it can't be from him. Some people say, you know, oh, yeah, it is, but he wouldn't say stuff like this. Listen, I, I, I don't care. And if God has the power to burn Mark 16, uh, 9 through 20, if he wanted it out of there, it's there. And so I embrace it. I was uh, as part of the uh, uh, Southern Baptist Church would not have been. In fact, I would have been told, just don't even read it because it's not relevant. <laughs> now, how do you like that? Right. But we're going to read through it here together. Mark 16, 9. When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him who were mourning and weeping. And when they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, they did not believe it. Afterward, Jesus appeared in a different form to two of uh, them while they were walking in the country. They, uh, these returned and reported it to the rest, but they didn't believe him either. Later, Jesus appeared to the 11 as they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he's risen. Hey, listen, these people broke bread with Jesus, walked every step with Jesus, watched the miracles of Jesus, watched his supernatural teaching from Jesus. And still, uh, they're hearing uh, what he told them would happen actually happened. They don't believe it. So he's he, he's rebuking them and, and basically saying, wake up, right? Um, and so here we are. In 15, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe in my name. They will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. When they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. And basically, he's saying, listen, you know, <laughs> I've already shown you the way. And I'm leaving you with the things that I've been trying to teach you all along from throughout my ministry. Now, I don't want you to get weird here and think about uh, snake handling uh, church and all that stuff. You know, when it says they'll pick up snakes, they'll drink poison. All it's saying is, I'm with you. I have you. I'll protect you. That's all that's really saying. And, and the pick up snake thing came from a, a time when Paul was actually bitten and nothing happened. But, you know, it, it's not to get off track here. So basically, he's saying, I'm giving you these signs will accompany those who believe. Do you believe? Because I believe. And I'm not about to erase scripture because theologians can't decide whether it sounds like Mark wrote it or not. It's in the Bible. It's in all translations of the Bible, just with the notation. So I, I know that, you know, whoever doesn't believe will be condemned. I know that it says what we just read, right? Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. This is the, what he's talking about here. Denying its power. It doesn't exist. We're just, what was the purpose of Jesus? And, you know, was it just show and tell? Not, not, I'm trying to teach you. I'm trying to mold you. I'm trying to shape you. You're going to be my disciples. And, you know, he, he's, he's telling them to go forth. I've given you everything. I'm trying to show you. It wasn't just show and tell. It was trying to teach. And that's still today what we're supposed to take, with, take and run with, right? After the Lord Jesus had spoken to, him, uh, to them, he was taken up into heaven. Hold on a second. Having a screen problem here. And sat at the right hand of God. And the disciples preached everywhere. So they did. Listen, and we've talked about this recently. You know, we, we tend to think, oh, the disciples and all the apostles, they were set aside. They were absolutely amazing. We learned from them. 
They were average, uneducated, ordinary men that God turned into just warriors for Jesus, right? And that's what we're supposed to be. Remember, a disciple is somebody who is following Jesus. We're following Jesus and one who is uh, being taught. And so we should be in that perpetual mode of being taught. So here we go. Go into the world, preach the gospel to all creation. That's what we're supposed to be doing. You know, Jesus uh, healed a, an impure spirit. And I'm coming in for a, a, a landing here to bring it all together. But Jesus heals um, a possessed uh, impure spirit. So we're in Mark 9, 14. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. And what does he say? What are you arguing with them about? Can you imagine? What are you arguing about? And a man in the crowd answered, teacher, I, br I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I ask your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. They weren't able to do it. And what does Jesus say? I just think he gets exasperated here. He said, you unbelieving generation. Remember, he just told us as he was, uh, you know, going off to heaven, he just said, these, these things you're going to do in my name, right? And so here we are. He says, you unbelieving generation. Like, how long shall I stay with you? How, how, how many of you have said some point in your lifetime, how many times do I have to show you? How many times? This is basically what he said. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. He, he's basically saying, I guess I got to do it myself. I've showed you all these times, right? You don't have the faith, you unbelieving generation. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be part of an unbelieving generation. I want to be able to exercise the power I read about, the things that he's given to me. With, with, with I, I don't want to hesitate to step in to do these things, right? So they brought the boy to him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth, but the spirit did come out. So the point here is, you know, uh, you know, they're using the name of Jesus, but they don't, they don't believe. We've got to believe in the supernatural things of God, guys. I'm going to see some supernatural stuff because I believe, and I want you to see it too, right? I do. Acts 19.11. Now, God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. So I'm going to pause right there. Everything that we talk about from, uh, you know, this point forward, especially during the season of talking about, um, you know, the supernatural, we're talking about, you know, the, the demonic, uh, you know, influences and all that stuff. You know, I want you to know that we we can do nothing without Jesus, right? And it's going to be explained or shown to you in, in, in the word in just a second. So it says, now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. God empowered Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick and, and disease, the disease left them and the evil spirits went out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists uh, took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits saying, we exercise you by the G uh, Jesus from whom Paul preaches. And there were also seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest who, who did so. And so they're then using the name of Jesus, right? And this evil spirit says, he answered and said, Jesus, I know. And Paul, I know. Who are you? Listen, the, we are dealing in a spiritual war. And no matter what, uh, we, last week we talked about how the evangelical churches, the majority of them don't even believe there is a Satan. They think that bad stuff comes from the enemy, but they don't believe we've got a real, uh, you know, enemy, you know, and, and we do. And so this is, uh, you know, the devil basically speaking through someone saying, Jesus, I know, Paul, I know, but who are you? Let me tell you, I want every demon in hell to know who I am I, because I want to be their worst nightmare. I don't want they, they to not going to be playing with me or my family. I can tell you that because I know how to do war. I know how to pray, but I pray with belief. And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Can you imagine how scary that was? And this became known both to all the Jews and the Greeks uh, dwelling in Ephesus and fear fell on them all, as you, as you can imagine, right? And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified and uh, many who came believed came 
confessing, <clears throat> excuse me, and many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds, which is witnessing. This is why our story is important, to tell the good things of Christ, right? And also many who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. So they were so convicted by this. So look at this scary episode, right, where they're, they're using the name of Jesus, and but they didn't know Jesus. See, they didn't really believe. They were just using his name. And this evil spirit called them on it. And they knew, they, listen, we need to know Jesus. We need to know Jesus. If there's any doubt in your life, we need to talk. If you, you know, we need to be um, pressing forward and sharing the gospel to be sure that as many people know Jesus as we can introduce them to, right? And so that's why. So here we see, uh, you know, <clears throat> many things, excuse me, we see that the evil spirit was violent, uh, came out, over, overpowered them and prevailed. And it scared the stew out of everybody as it should. But the beauty of it is all things work together for good. And so here, um, because they were fearful, they looked at it and they, they knew Jesus, you know, had, the power was with Jesus. Um, you know, they just came to him and they, they were humbled and they, you know, began to worship him and burned everything against them. You know, we're actually going to be burning things at the well here. If you think I'm a lunatic, you just don't have to come back next week. But we're going to be burning some of these things. You know, strongholds in families, if you, people don't understand that. I did a study uh, for myself. I didn't teach it uh, several years ago on the spiritual strongholds, generational strongholds. You see, you can't be possessed. If you believe, uh, you know, in the Lord, you're saved. You can't be possessed but you can be oppressed and you can have family things, generational things like the things we talk about, alcoholism, adultery, you know, all divorce, all these things following through a family. That it's not just because that's what happens in your tribe. That's because the devil has a stronghold going on and it needs to be broken. And so and it can be right. And so we know that, uh, you know, we, we need to understand what it is. We need to understand what the war is and we need to face it head on. And I was able to do that. You know, to to basically, you know, basically uh, cut the change, you know, of generational curses, if you will, that ran through my family. You can do the same thing through yours. And when people see these things, they 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 it's your testimony, right? When I tell people who I used to be and I tell people, wow, I came from a long line of those. And I say, well, I wish I could show you a, you know, a DVD that could show you who I was before Christ. I'm telling them my story. I'm telling them what he did in my life. And that's what happened here. These people saw it on. They said, oh my goodness. And their faith grew and it got rid of the filth in their life. They got rid of all the other gods in their life. And they began to worship him. What a beautiful thing. So Satan is real, folks. It not Again, I'm not saying it's to scare you. And I haven't lost my mind. You were talking about the, a lot of people that you know come into the folds of any church these days come from a Catholic background. And you know that exorcisms are you know done in the Catholic church. They've always been done in the Catholic church. But here's something amazing. You know that the world of psychiatry is now they're they're training up more and more uh, Catholic exorcists because the world of psychiatry is saying I don't, I have no idea how to deal with this person nothing works uh, you know drugs don't work chains don't work uh, you know electric whatever you call that shock therapy doesn't work nothing works I think we're dealing with it we've got the world <laughs> unsaved uh, pretty much you know saying. I can't deal with this. Find me a priest that'll help get rid of this demon. And yet most of us say, oh, I don't think that's real. No, the, the Satan is very real. Now, a lot of times uh, unbelievers will say, uh, well, if God's so great, why would he um, create Satan? Well, he didn't create Satan. He created the angels and Satan rebelled and became the worst rebel of all, right? And he was cast into hell because of it. God doesn't create sin. He doesn't, he doesn't create an alcoholic. He doesn't create a drug addict. He doesn't uh, create a whore. He doesn't create a bank robber. He doesn't create a transgender. He doesn't create any of that stuff. He creates a perfect being the way he designed us to be. And, and the, in the fallen world, we take it and run with it. The devil lets us, uh, helps us do that, right? So he's real. He's just under the surface of every day uh, uh, of your life, uh, hiding in the shadows. Remember he, uh, when when God said, what are you doing here? And then Satan said, I'm looking for some, to, I'm going to prowl around and devour somebody. That's what he wants to do, to rob, steal, kill, right? Or steal, kill, destroy. He wants to do those things. He wants to take everything from your life. And so, and he has the power to do it 
if you know what, if you deny its power and you don't get equipped to fight the spiritual war, we're not going to let this guy win. You know, I want to take your hand and we're going to walk through this together and be empowered. You know, angels and demons in a spiritual war. We know that we are in a spiritual war because we read it. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. How many times do we have to read it? Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. <laughs> it's against the you know principalities in the heavenly realms. It's that demonic world, right? They all exist, but uh, we don't have to live in fear of that stuff. You know, it, when we start to see supernatural things, I, I, I would say at the well uh, pretty often, I'm going to see the glory of God in this barn. And the glory of God would scare a lot of people, right? It's that Shekinah glory. It's that, that cloud, if you will, where the Holy Spirit can be seen uh, to the extent possible. You know, I, I'm going to see that. But the supernatural scares most people. Listen, I would want nothing to do with a God that wasn't supernatural. OK, my God is supernatural. My God, you know, called every star in the sky and, and, and called them each by name. My God parted the sea and made land. He, he, he created everything. He's a supernatural God. And so I for as for me, I don't want to live in a, in a Christian journey that negates all the supernatural. I don't. And so I don't want to deny his power. It's a real war. And the longer Christians are looking at. They're a journey, more of an intellectual journey. I need to learn more. I need the Hebrew degree. And as long as they're there, he's winning, right? Because we're not looking at the truth and preaching the truth. The Holy Spirit brings God's promises to mind when we need them the most. The word says, I'll give you the words that you need when you need them. And boy, I'll tell you, as the time draws near, and I think I'm going to still be alive with it, we're going to see some supernatural stuff going on. And I want to be a part of it right? I want to be a part of it. And you can too. The supernatural things the Bible tells us. You can read for yourself so many uh, scriptures on the war. You see Ephesians 6, 10, of course, is, you know, one that would be most familiar to people. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. And see, God's telling us, take action. It's not like go in your prayer closet and pray about them. Uh -uh. He's saying you put it on. And so you can stand against the devil's schemes. But going down here to the more highlighted is, is really my favorite. Second Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Read that again. OK, the weapons we fight with are not weapons of this world. Now, it's not a Uzi. OK, it's not a 22. It's not a slingshot. It's not a bomb. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. And that's exactly what I tapped into when I did business for my family to, de to uh, demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. That's what a warrior looks like. I love that scripture. But anyway, I think you should uh, take the time to look it up. So we're going to be studying here at the well. And you're going to be hearing on Sunday nights a good part of this. Uh, this is uh, John Ramirez. And John Ramirez is a former satanic priest. <laughs> you want to hear about this stuff and how to fight it and what the schemes are, then you need to, <clears throat> you know, listen to him. I love this on Charisma Magazine because we had Greg Locke here. Pastor Greg Locke is seen there in the other picture. And here's John Ramirez, both coming to a simple barn in Virginia. But uh, anyway, so we're going to be, uh, the, the study that we're going to be doing here and that I'm going to be feeding to you on Sunday nights is a spiritual warfare boot camp. And it's going to be coming straight from the horse's mouth. Somebody with, uh, you know, that has been there and done that uh, for, I think, 20 years of his life. He walked that. He did the devil's business. And now he's an evangelist and goes around the world. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. This is real thing. OK. And he's going to be uh, walking us through that. So why do we need help? Well, you know, because most of us, again, we were taught to have a form of godliness, but deny its power. I tell often, I said it this morning, I'll say it in front of you guys more often than you want to hear it. But the former pastor I had, I just loved him so much because I grew so much in the Lord. He saw me through, you know, the most trying times of my life. And, and I'll just always, he's with the Lord now, I'll just always uh, just treasure that time. But he, he would be praying for revival and he would say, if the Holy Spirit showed up here, y'all would make a new door and run out the back. And he's right. Most people don't want it. We, 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 we were taught that it's not good. It's not real. Uh, you know, at least in, in that world, Southern Baptist is what uh, he, he was and I was, you know, uh, he, we would just run from it. It scares us. We're told don't even look at it. That's probably not even written by Mark. We're told all kinds of stuff because we need to understand what we're up against. 
you, you really want to live a life of, uh, you know, just being <laughs> fiery darts coming at you and family issues and sickness and all this stuff and be powerless? I don't. We need to understand what we're up against. We need to understand the armor, what that really, really means to stand up and take action for Christ. And we need to fight the battles in the heavenlies, not next door. Your problem isn't in the White House. My problem is not in the White House. The problem isn't in the schools. The problem is in hell. And, and we're allowing that to prevail because we don't know how to fight. And so we're going to be learning how to fight. And I hope you'll join us. You know, we need to accept the power that's already been given to us. Remember what Jesus said. I'm giving you this. And, and, and go baptize and make disciples of the nations. And, and, and he's gave it. He's already given it to us. And we need to break the chains of that bondage. We need to break the chains of what we've been taught to believe. Instead of looking at what did what does the Bible teach, we've been uh, ordained into certain belief systems. And, and I'm not saying they're bad. I'm grateful for my time in the churches. But now that I'm older and I'm uh, wiser by the because Jesus says, if you want wisdom, ask for it. And I've asked for it. And I see things differently. If you read the full context of the Bible, there's so much that we were taught to stay away from. And that's having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And so that's it for me, guys. I just want you to know where we're headed, uh, where we're going to be in this journey. And uh, see if you have any questions or comments or anything tonight. I'm happy to answer them if I can. Anybody? I have no questions, but I thank you so much. This is wonderful, all that you put together here. You're very welcome. Very welcome. It's, uh, again, being recorded if you didn't screenshot or take a picture of some of the scripture. So, you know, you can get that recording and take a look again so that you can look it up for yourself. I always, call, I always tell people, hey, check me on that, <laughs> right? Yeah, I'm just a, a vessel. You know, I, I'm just a, 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 I would say that I best described as a teacher or an evangelist, maybe, but you know, you, you look it up. You, you need to mm -hmm. check. Every, we all need to check. Check me. So I'll give you the scripture on that. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining but it, us. It just flows through you so well. God oh. has really touched you to do his work. Oh, my no doubt about it. Thank you so much. Well, you know, there's, we all have gifts. No, not one is greater than another. Some are more visible. Um, I fall into that category. It's more visible, but it's not greater. We all work together. Each gift is a treasure. And when we put a, a take what he's gifted us with and we give it to him and say, okay, Lord, it's we're always going to excel. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter, right? But thank you for that. Thank you so much. Heather, I think you unmuted. Did you have something to share? Well, I it was very powerful. You your sessions your time uh it's chock full of things chock full of ideas and and uh teachings of uh, uh teachings of the bible it's uh just just so full of so much and it's it's um it's a lot to it's well it's i'm really i'm impressed i, I i'm i'm grateful um I'm trying, to, I'm taking it all in as best I can. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good. You're such a blessing, Heather, such an encourager. And I'm so glad you found your way here. Thank and, you. Uh, you know, she's she's got a study Bible now, so she's digging into it. And if you're not already doing it, um, you might want to go to the YouTube recordings and watch again and pause and go to your Bible and look up the notes, the study notes, the study guides. You know, might it might be a good thing for you. To, you know, some people I'm told actually do take this, the recorded version. They have Bible study in their house. <laughs> they do that. They'll pause. Wait a minute. Look that scripture up. You know, they 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 actually use this. How, praise the Lord for what He does, right? So I'm grateful you found your way here. I really am, and you're such an encourager to us all. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Heather. And anybody else? Okie dokie. Well, I think, Carol, your lips are moving, but your ventriloquist <laughs> has taken a break. <laughs> Can you unmute? There we go. There you go. I said, I stand in awe and thanksgiving for the great vessel that you have allowed 
the Lord to use you to teach so much to so many. Mm. You live it, you believe it, you teach it. It's it's just awe inspiring. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm humbled by you, uh, my sisters out there. I really am. But they trust me when I tell you. I know it's not you. Apart from him, there's nothing good in me apart from him. And so it's it's interesting that the journey he took me on to finally bring me to where I am today. And now it's like, um, all I want to do, <laughs> right? It's all I want to do. But thank you. There's nothing in me. Every week you could ask Doug how much we pray about. You know, let there be nothing in me. Nothing in me. I don't want there to be anything. I just want to be the vessel that brings what he gave me. Right? And that's what's happening. Thank and you. I hope you go very far to teach so many more people than just the handful that you reach now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you just don't know what the, the Holy Spirit fire will do. But, you know, I, I've i shared with some of you guys a few years back, there was, um, I don't know, it, I, I guess it was a prophetic word. Uh, it's it's too long a story to share the whole thing, but I'm on the phone with a total stranger. The stranger doesn't know what I do. They don't know where I live. They don't know. Their barn hasn't been turned into a chapel. You know, we were talking. I was really trying to pick their brain about a training, actually. Um, she knew my name, and that's all she knew. We hadn't connected on social media, nothing. And so she starts to tell me about the course, and then she says, hold on a second. This is, it's Christian, obviously, faith-based course. And she said, hold on a second. She said, I, this has only happened to me a few times in my life, but the Lord has something he wants me to share with you. Would you allow me to do that? And I said, well, it's God. Yeah. <laughs> you know, who am I to do that? And, and it was so beautiful because she said, um, you know, I see you. Um, there's a lot of wood around you. I remember the barn hasn't been done yet. So you're, you're, there's wood behind you and you have a microphone. She doesn't know what I do. She didn't know I was an auctioneer. She doesn't know I was a trainer for Dale Carnegie. She didn't know anything, right? And she said, you have a microphone. And standing next to you are two, I don't know who they are, but she said, they're very, like, like famous kind of people. And, and, and you're teaching or doing something, right? So here we are. We've had, you know, Pastor Greg Locke, his worldwide known evangelist, and John Ramirez worldwide. Who would ever think only God could bring them to a barn, right? And so then she says to me, um, so do you live on a lake? And I said, no. And she said, do you live at the beach? And I said, no. And she said, well, I don't know what it is, but there's something to do with water. You're surrounded by water. So here we are um, at the Living Waters Farm, <laughs> right? In a place we've named the well, mm -hmm. surrounded by wood. All right. uh, not necessarily with a microphone, but preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ with everything within me. The, the Lord put that there. And I got goosebumps. I had no idea what was coming. No idea. But the Lord knew. And look what he's done. Praise the Lord. So we don't know. My, my, my point there, Carol, is we don't know how far reaching. You know, this I know that the YouTubes will they go overseas we know yeah. you know that there are a couple of people from the philippines that begged me i've got a message right now i didn't send last week's story yet please send it to me but well, you know i need the word well, it, people in turkey uh, excuse me india we and those i know about but there are other people so we don't know the oh, sure. all we have to do is be obedient and it never comes down to numbers does it it comes down to oh no no, no 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 yeah absolutely more the power of the truth. And that's one thing I, I'm, I, I can say that I do. Um, and I have always done is speak the truth for Jesus. I do. I don't want to hurt you ever. I love you. I want to tell you the truth. And, and if you're hurt, we'll get through it together. But I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to fluff it up. I'm not going to whitewash the gospel of Jesus Christ ever. So on that note, let me pray us out here. Gracious Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we just love you so much, Lord, that it's just so beautiful what you're doing is so beautiful that you would bring forth this whole message, Lord, and equip us, strengthen us, Lord. We know that you've already given us everything we need, but unfortunately, Lord, unfortunately, Lord we've become a lukewarm church out there, and we've not been preaching the truth. We have not been uh, uh, telling testimonies that have the ability to bring people to Jesus. We haven't been doing it. And consequently, the war is raging and the enemy knows his time is near, Lord, but he got no hope when it comes. We're equipped. 
Once we, we understand what we've got, Lord, the power within us, in the name of Jesus, he doesn't stand a chance. Lord, I thank you for each one here. I thank you for each one, Lord, that is usually a part of our group that isn't here and vacationing and often sick and whatever they are, Lord, I pray for them. And I pray, God, that they'll be back with us soon. But more than anything, Lord, I pray that you just ignite, just ignite your word, Lord, and take it out to the ends of the earth, Lord, you know, as we, um, you know, just move forward with what you have for us, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for being our God. Thank you for choosing us before the foundations of the earth. Thank you, Lord, for calling us to yourself. We love you. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. 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 Thank you. Good night, Thank all. you, Blaine. Thank you. Love you guys. Know where to find me. We'll see you next time. Exactly. Bye-bye.